Good morning. It's good to see each one of you here. Our subject this morning, Is There Fire in Hell? And our custom is to stand and read the Word of God together in deference to God's Word. So if everyone stand, please. The Scriptures are printed in your bulletin. So if you'll just look in your bulletin, you'll see the Scriptures all printed out there. And we'll read in unison. I'll read the first verse, and you follow along with the next. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 26. And I'll read verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain man named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And he gave him passes of daily diet was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that will come from hence. Thank you. Be seated, please. Our subject is the fire in hell. Now this is denied by so many today that I felt that I should bring a message on it. During World War II, a new chaplain was appointed to a battleship. And a group of shipmen came to see him. They say, Chaplain, we want to know one thing. Do you believe there's a hell? He said, of course not. We don't believe in hell. And they said, then, sir, we're going to request that you resign. Because if there is a hell, we don't want you lying to us. And if there's not a hell, we don't need a chaplain anyway. This incident in Luke was told by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that gave this message. All I'm doing is repeating His message. People say, well, gentle, G gentle Jesus, meek and mild, He would never send anyone to hell. But Jesus is the person who gave us this message. And He's the one that affirmed it to be true. So we need to preach it. Somebody has said if there was more preaching in the church, there would be less hell in the pews. It does need to be preached. And we don't shy away from preaching all the counsel of God. Now this incident described by Luke is not a parable. I know that most people think it is, but it is not a parable. And I'll tell you why it's not. First of all, it's not a parable because the names of people are used in this story Jesus told. In the second place, Abraham is mentioned. And Abraham was a historical person. And so it's not a parable. In parables, names are not given. So what Jesus told here was not a parable. You'll notice in verse 19 he said there was a and then he used an adjective to describe this rich man. A certain rich man. In other words, there's a certainty attached to this. This isn't just a story Jesus told. It is a truth about something that happened to a certain individual. A certain man, it says. There are four words that have been translated hell in our King James Bible. The first word is Sheol, and that's an Old Testament word, 
and it's translated hell 31 times in the scriptures. Hell and Hades, which is going to follow, are the same place. The third word is Hades, or the second word is Hades, translated hell 11 times in the King James Version. The third word is Tartarus, and it is translated one time in 2 Peter 2.4 as hell. And we believe it is the prison house of the fallen angels. And the fourth word is Gehenna. Gehenna is translated 11 times as hell in the New Testament. And 11 times Jesus used the word. Gehenna was a valley east of Jerusalem. And into that valley they poured all their garbage, all their trash, and the dead bodies of felons, such as criminals and murderers. And it became a place of refuge. And it was a place where the worm does not die. It's a place, Jesus said, where the fire never goes out. And so it was a continual burning. It was continually burning because they continually added refuse and trash and garbage to it. And the worms continued to grow as they fed upon it. A place called Gehenna. It really means the Valley of Hinnom. And so we speak this morning primarily about Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnom. Now there are many other references to hell also, and I'll give you just a few of those so you'll have a, a, a fairly good uh, picture of how many times it's used in the Bible. Notice the word fire in the New Testament signifies eternal torment. And the adjectives that are used with it are striking. Notice this. Matthew 3.12, unquenchable fire. Matthew 13.42, a furnace of fire. In that place shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 18.8, the eternal fire. And Matthew 18, 9, the hell, Gehenna of head fire. Matthew 25, 41, eternal fire. Mark 9, 43, the unquenchable fire. And Mark 9, 48, the fire is not quenched. Luke 3, 17, unquenchable fire. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, flaming fire. Jude 7, eternal fire. Revelation 14, 10, tormented with fire and brimstone. Revelation 19, 20, thrown alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And Revelation 20, 10, thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. And Revelation 21, 8, the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. So it is clear from these passages which I just read, that Gehenna is a place which is eternal. It lasts forever. And it is unquenchable because it will never die and the fire will never be put out. It's a horrible thing to consider the fact that men and women will go to that place. I have a little poem I'll share with you. It's in two parts. What won't be there and what will be there. Hell, the prison house of despair. Here are some things that won't be there. No flowers will bloom on the banks of hell. No beauties of nature that we love so well. No comforts of home, music and song. No friendship of joy will be found in that throng. No children to brighten the long weary night. No love or peace nor one ray of light. No blood-washed soul with face beaming bright. No loving smile in that region of night. No mercy, no pity, pardon nor grace. No water. Oh God, what a terrible place. The pangs of the lost, no human can tell. Not one moment's ease. There is no rest in hell. What will be there? Hell, the prison house of despair. Here are some things that will be there. 
fire and brimstone are there, we know, for God in His Word has told us so. Memory, remorse, suffering and pain, weeping and wailing, but all in vain. Blasphemers, swearers, haters of God, Christ rejectors, while here on earth trod. Murderers, gamblers, drunkards, liars, will all have their part in the lake of fire. The filthy, the vile, the cruel, and the mean, what a horrible mob in hell will be seen. Yes, more than human on earth can tell are torments and woes of eternal hell. I'm going to use primarily just scripture this morning. I'm not going to interject my own thoughts or anything else, but rather just to give you all the scriptures of the Word of God. In Revelation 14 and verses 10 and 11, we find the phrase fire and brimstone and then a phrase torment forever and ever. Let me read that. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of his holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and forever. And they have no rest day nor night. This word forever and ever is from the Greek. It's translated from the Greek phrase Tonanius Tonanion. That means forever and forever. It's found 13 times in the New Testament. Forever and ever. Nine times it is used of the existence of God. We know that God is forever. Tonanius Tonanion. And then secondly, one time it is used of the eternal existence of the saints up in heaven. Thirdly, once it is used of eternal torment of the devil in hell. And fourthly, the other two times it is used of the duration of the lost in eternal torment. The word eternal is used 72 times in the New Testament. It refers 44 times to eternal life and the endless and unchangeableness of eternity. Eternal is used 15 times in a way that could only be endless. 13 remaining times, it can never be used of anything that has a known end. The New Testament contains 27 books, 264 chapters, 234 times God speaks of a place of eternal punishment. Now if I were traveling along life's road, and within a 26 mile radius, I would see 234 signboards warning me this road leads to destruction. I think I would turn around and get on another road. Amen? Common sense would tell us when God tells you 234 times that the road of unbelief leads to the lake of fire. It's time to turn around. It's time to turn around. Hell is a place. So last Sunday I preached on heaven. And I told you that heaven was a place. And I pointed that out with many scriptures. Today I preach on hell is a place. And there are many scriptures. First of all, hell is a real place. It's not an imaginary place. It's not a place conjured up by poets or storytellers. Hell is a real place, just as real as Chiang Mai, Thailand. The Bible says in verse 23 of this rich man, and in hell he lift up his eyes. He was in a real place. Hell, secondly, is a place of knowledge. Verse 23, lift up his eyes, being in torments, and see if Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. It's a place of knowledge. He knew Abraham. He knew Lazarus. Thirdly, hell is a place of consciousness. Verse 23 again. Being in torments shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Fourthly, hell is a place of torment. Revelation 14. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest 
day or night. Have you ever been so sick that you tossed on the bed back and forth and you couldn't sleep and you ate and you hurt and you were in pain and you would sigh and pray all oh, for a little rest. If I could just get a little rest. But in hell, there is no rest. Not one moment's peace or rest. Fifthly, hell is a place of crying, pleading, and begging. This beggar, this rich man became a beggar. Revelation 21, 8 tells us, Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me. He was crying for mercy. He shouldn't have cried for mercy while he had the opportunity. He lived on earth for a number of years. He could have cried for mercy at any time. And he never once cried to God for mercy. The mercy of salvation that God is so willing to grant. But here, this man now cries for mercy. But it's too late. It's too late. Then sixthly, hell is a place of vile companionships. Revelation 21, 8 declares the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. What a crowd to live for all eternity with. Never to be able to get away from. Adulterers, liars, thieves, homosexuals, child molesters, perverts, whoremongers. That's the kind of people the unsaved will spend all eternity with. That's their companionship. A man told me one time, well, I may go to hell, but I'll have a lot of companions. He sure will, but he's not going to appreciate them. How would you like to live with that motley crowd for all eternity? And then hell is also a place of fire. And this is not symbolical fire. This is literal fire. Verse 25, But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. A place of memory. You'll remember every time you heard a sermon. You'll remember every time that God dealt with you. You'll remember everything that pointed to God that you rejected. And then, in the ninth place, hell is a place of punishment. Jesus is coming back. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy 1 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Matthew 25, 46 says, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous in the life eternal. You see, it's, you've got to choose whether you want to spend eternity in heaven or eternity in hell. Hell is a place in the tenth place, eternal and everlasting. Verse 26, and beside all this, there between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they that would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. If you have a Schofield Bible, it's a good Bible. I've used it all my life. But it's wrong in some places. Not that the Bible is wrong, but the notes are wrong. And Schofield's notes tell us that uh, the Old Testament saints went to a place, a compartment below the earth, a kind of a holding tank. I don't believe that. I believe the Old Testament saints went to heaven. Tell me, where did Elijah go? The Bible says he went up into heaven without dying. Where did Enoch go? Enoch went into heaven without dying. There is no compartment below the earth for the Old Testament saints that were later taken to heaven. Paradise means heaven, and the saints went to paradise. Otherwise, it's a pretty good Bible. In the 11th place, hell has no exit. In every public hall, in every church,
church, in every building where the public assemble, there'll be a sign, there's one right up there. Exit. That means you can get out through that door. But in hell, there are no exits. There are no doors, no windows, no exit in hell. In the twelfth place, hell is a place of no hope. Ephesians 2.12 That at that time, speaking to the Christians who are now saved, ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world, no hope in hell. That was our condition before we were saved. Without God and without hope. And the reason I preach this message is because it might move someone who's not saved, who has no hope, to hope in Christ. You see, preaching hell has a purpose. Not to scold, but to move men and women to trust Christ. The famous evangelist said, I've had more people saved preaching on hell than I ever had preaching on heaven. I believe that's true. That's why I'm preaching that this morning. If you have no hope, you know where you're going. But before you leave here, I'll tell you how you can have hope. Hell is a place that's avoided. John 5, 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Before you leave here this morning, you can pass from death unto life. You say, well, I don't want to wait till the sermon's over. I want to know now, how can I be saved? How can I miss hell? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's God's word. There was a Philippian jailer. He had put Paul and Silas in the prison stocks. He had whipped them with a whip. And about midnight, God knocked the jail off its foundations. And that old jailer got under conviction, these are men of God, and I whipped them, and I've imprisoned them, and what am I going to do? And he cried out, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. If ever a man was in dire straits and wanted to know how to be saved, it was that old flipping jailer. And Paul didn't beat around the bush. He told him exactly what to do. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Now, of course, that presupposes some things. It presupposes repentance and faith and coming to Christ. But all of that will follow when you put your trust and your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hell is a boy. Hell is is for sinners, souls, and bodies. Souls and bodies. You see, when a man or a woman goes to hell, they go soul and body. They both go to hell. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Nobody can kill your soul. But rather fear him, which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now that's what Jesus said. And of course, one would be foolish to argue with Jesus. He would be ignorant to not believe what Jesus told us. And the question comes to mind, who will be in hell? Well, I know some that will be there. Cain will be there. He slew his brother. The antediluvian world that scoffed at Noah and then drowned in the flood. They'll be there. Jezebel with her painted face murdered and let Naboth to get his vineyard. She'll be there. Pilate who will still be trying to wash his hands of the blood of Christ. He'll be there. 
King Agrippa, who said, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. He said that I believe in sarcasm. He wished now he had that opportunity. Judas, who sold our Lord for 30 pieces of silver, he'll be there, even though he went and hung himself. That won't, that won't take away the remorse. That won't take away his place in hell. Hypocrites who are false professors professing to the world that they're Christians, but they've never been born again, never trusted Christ, never gone to the cross, bowed before the Son of God and said, God have mercy to me, a sinner. Herodias' daughter who danced her soul into hell when she had John the Baptist beheaded. They'll be there. And if you've never trusted Christ, you'll be there. You'll be there. Now someone will say, well, preaching hell is cruel. No, it's not. Is it cruel to tell men the truth? Is a doctor cruel because he tells his patient he has to do surgery to save his life? Is it cruel to label cyanide as a poison and then warn people not to drink it? Is it cruel to push a man into a lifeboat from a sinking ship? Is it cruel to arouse a sleeping people and tell them their house is on fire? It's not cruel. You see, the preachers of our day, most of them deny hell and they never preach it. And the poor souls that sit under their ministry will die and go to hell never having heard a sermon on hell. Never having been given an opportunity to repent of their sins. Who will be there? Well, I just ran across one more point. I dreamed of the great judgment morning had dawned and the trumpet had blown. I dreamed that the nations had gathered to judgment before the white throne. From the throne came a bright shining angel and stood on the land and the sea and swore with his hand raised to heaven that time was no longer to be. The rich man was there, but his money had melted and vanished away. A pauper, he stood in the judgment. His debts were too heavy to pay. The great man was there, but his greatness, when death came, was left far behind. The angel that opened the records, not a trace of his greatness could find. The gambler was there, and the drunkard, and the man that sold him the drink, with the people who sold him the license, together in hell they did sink. The moral man came to the judgment, but his self-righteous rags would not do. The men who had crucified Jesus had passed off as moral men too. The soul that had put off salvation, not tonight, I'll get saved by and by. As the lost were told of their fate, they cried to the rocks and the mountains. They prayed, but their prayer was too late. I'll give you a brief summary of hell. Hell is a lake of fire, Revelation 20, 15. A devouring fire, Isaiah 33, 14. A bottomless pit, Revelation 20, verse 1. Everlasting burnings, Isaiah 33, 14. A furnace of fire, Matthew 13, 41. A place of torments, Luke 16, 23. Where they curse God, Revelation 16, 11. A place of filthiness, Revelation 22, 10. Where they can never repent, Matthew 12, 32. A place where they have no rest, Revelation 14, 11. A place of everlasting punishment, Matthew 25, 46. A place of blackness and darkness forever, Jude 13. A place where they gnaw their tongues, Revelation 16, 10. A place where their breath will be a living flame, Isaiah 33, 11. A place prepared for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, 41. A lake of fire in which people are cast alive, Revelation 19.20. A place which 
which the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. A place where they drink the wine of the wrath of God. Revelation 14.10 A place where they do not want their loved ones to come. Luke 16.28 A place where there are murderers, liars, spiritual and abominable. Revelation 21.8 That's what the Bible says about hell. And I'm preaching this because I know it's not an enjoyable thing to listen to. It's awful. It's terrible. It's hideous. But it's just and it's right. Why does a merciful, loving God prepare this place? He did not prepare it for people. He prepared it for the devil and his angels. But you will have to join that crowd if you ever sin. And who among us has not sinned? For all has sinned and come short of the glory of God. But I preach on hell because God would not be just if He did not punish sin. God would not be just he would not be righteous. He would not be true if He did not punish sin. So the moral government of the universe is governed by a holy God. And if you want to know why there is a hell, I can tell it to you in one short sentence. God is holy. That's why. And He will not let anything unholy into His presence. Well, we're all a bunch of sinners, are we not? We are. But most of us have been saved by grace. We have seen ourselves as sinners. We have kneeled before the crucified one at Calvary's cross. We have lifted our eyes up to Him and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And we have received grace and mercy and salvation. And we have peace in our hearts. And God is our Father. And we know that someday we're going to be in His presence in heaven. And we know that He cares for us day by day. We know that He loves us. Because we're in the family of God. We're His people. And if you're still outside, still outside the pale of His people, still outside of the mercy of God. Why not come and avail yourself today of the mercy of God when the old publican sinner knelt down on his knees, he would not lift his eyes to heaven, but he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified. If you've never trusted Christ this morning, you've never publicly confessed Him as your Savior, you've never followed Him in baptism, you've never had a walk with God, you've never had the joy of knowing your sins are forgiven, whatever it is, if you're still on the outside looking in, come in. And then from the inside, look out and give praise to God for His mercy. Let's stand together, please. We're going to sing just a verse of invitation, just as I am. Brother Jim, if you'll read this off, please. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ, would you do it now? And then having done that, having trusted Him, looking unto Him, would you come and say, I want to make it publicly known that today I'm trusting Christ. I'm willing to follow Him in baptism. I'm willing to be a Christian. I want to be saved this morning. Would you come? Just as I am without one plea, I God has done a work in your heart, we will come. If He hasn't, we don't want you to come. We don't want you to make a false profession of faith. 
And so we leave it with you. Where will you spend eternity? Let's bow together to be dismissed in prayer. And Brother Dan, good to have you this morning. Would you dismiss us, please? Lord, we thank you for the message that we've heard today, Lord. We've heard you speak. Lord, we know that hell is real. Lord, and that you're just in sending all sinners there. The Lord, we know through your Son that you've saved us. Lord, we thank you so much for the grace that we found. Lord, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that we keep this message in our mind, in our hearts, and Lord, that we have an urgency to share the gospel with others. Lord, and that we know that without the gospel, they're hell bound. Lord, help us to seek opportunities to witness. Lord, we thank you so much. Lord, we think about our families, we think about our friends, but there's a whole a world of people out here, Lord, that we don't know. Lord, and we're the ones that you give our duty to, to inform others. Lord, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the message that goes forth from this church. Lord, may it, all that's done here be done in your glory. Pray in Jesus' name.